well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Joining us from Los Angeles is Perry Wong. He's the Managing Director of Research at the Milken Institute. With us from Boston is Ravi Ramamurti. He's a distinguished professor and the director of Northeastern University Center for Emerging Markets. John Sidalides is a geopolitical strategist with Trilogy Advisors. He joins us from New York. And with us from Montreal is Yan Wong. He's a partner with Alpine Macro and their chief emerging markets and China strategist. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Yan Wong, let me start with you. These are pretty sweeping predictions by this report uh, by Standard Chartered. China being the number one economy measured by GDP by 2030. But let's take a step back and look at Chinese growth for, for 2018. That was last year. Those figures have just come out. China grew by 6.6% last year. That's relatively low for China. And given those figures and the general slowdown, uh, do you think that the country is still on target to be the biggest economy by 2030? Um, yes, I do think so. I, actually, I think uh, it's not a, a whether or not. It's actually just a... a uh, when this will happen, you know, think about it. Um, uh, if we just extrapolate Chinese growth, let's say if the Chinese economy is able to grow, let's say 6% in nominal terms, uh, while the U.S., let's say, grow at 2.5% in nominal terms, then about 10 years, China will be able to surpass the U.S. in, the, in, in terms of the size of the economy. So I, don't, I, I have no doubt this will happen. Uh, it will happen even, let's say, a, a year uh, early or a year later, uh, I think that will be the, the question. But overall, I think the trend is very, very clear. All right, let's go to Boston, to Ravi. And Ravi, the Standard Chartered Report also predicts that India will pull ahead of the United States by 2030. Does that surprise you in any way? It, it does, and I actually don't think it will happen. I think uh, the projections for India are probably a little too optimistic. It will happen, though, to use, go back to the point made by the earlier speaker, it's, it will happen at some point. The exact time, I think, is a little bit up uh, to debate. I think 2030 may, may be a bit too early. 2040, I think, looks much more likely that uh, India will overtake. And we're talking about overtaking, pay, uh, measuring <coughs> GDP and purchasing power parity terms. This is not based on official exchange rates. All right, let's go to John. John, let's look at the other side of these predictions, the United States dropping into third place. Uh, why would the United States drop into third place? Will it just be because of a slow economy uh, or because it'll basically be population size that will be driving economies in the next 10 years? I don't know that I can accept the premise in the, chartered, uh, the standard chartered report, Anand. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're looking at here, again, as your speaker just mentioned, is that it's a flawed methodology that's based on purchasing power parity rather than, say, productivity per capita or GDP per capita or market exchange rates. Uh, the trend lines are accurate. As your first speaker said, China will soon surpass the United States. When that will be, it's a dangerous game of precision forecasting. India will be fortunate if it surpasses Japan in the next 30 years. It is so far behind in terms of overall GDP, but it has a billion and a half people. So, yes, it'll have a large economy, but my sense is we'll see the U.S. and Japan, I mean the U.S. and China, at number one and two for the next three decades. Perry Wong, let me ask you first, what are your thoughts on this report from Standard Chartered? Well, I, I think it's, it's very predictable that the Chinese economy, I think very soon, will surpass the U.S. economy in terms of size. But also, I, I would like to go back uh, to the population base. And, yeah, you have a 1.4 billion people economy, which you just make the simple assumption Everyone can see that, but that's not the point. The point, I think, is productivity and the orientation of the economies that matter more in terms of influence. Um, if we look at this list, we also see Indonesia, Egypt, and Turkey in the top ten. What do you make of that, Perry Wong? Well, Indonesia and also, if you look at the population base, is, is quite sizable in Asia and on a global stage. But I think the economy also is growing to, uh, in the right direction. So if it can continue uh, under the current policy and given a rather stable Southeast Asian political and economic orders or standards, then I think it's certainly a predictable outcome. Uh, it, it, I can see that happen. 
John, I just want to get back to you and what you were saying about how uh, this was measured in this report by Standard Chartered. Um, I mean, what role will mass consumer markets play in this measurement? An enormous role, Anand. And I think, again, uh, the PR team at Standard Charter did an excellent job in getting everyone to focus on this index over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I don't think the actual rankings are newsworthy, but what I think is most important here is the trend lines that Asia and its massive consumer market and a growing middle class really will become the center of the global economy in the decades ahead. We see it having happened already in China, especially after China was permitted to join the WTO 20 years ago. We see with the phenomenal growth of India now at 7 to 8 percent growth rates, probably for the foreseeable future. The Southeast Asia tigers that will continue to grow at rapid rates. And I think you're seeing a relative decline in Western Europe because of a lack of innovation. We have significant demographic problems there as well. And I think also the great other story is Africa. There were going to be a number of economies in Africa that will also be leapfrogging ahead of Western economies in the decades to come. Uh, Yan Wang, a few days ago I talked with the former Chinese ambassador, at least the former United States ambassador to China, Stapleton Roy. He's also a Chinese scholar right now at the Wilson Institute. Um, and I asked him about this, and this is what he had to say. Let's listen to it. China down the road, if it's able to sustain its rapid economic growth, uh, will not only have a larger economy than we have, but it will have comparable levels of prosperity. If you use the purchasing power parity measurement, China's economy is already larger than ours. So, Yan Wang, if we listen to what uh, Stapleton Roy, the ambassador, was saying there, um, how does China, uh, I mean, in world measurement in terms of, of, of growth, uh, do in things like innovation? Um, I agree with uh, uh, many speakers just mentioned. I think, you know, obviously uh, the size of the Chinese population matters a lot in terms of the size of the economy. So um, Chinese growth obviously brings a lot of prosperity, brings higher income, brings, you know, lift people's living standard. You know, the, all the Asian countries, if all the Asian countries are able to, uh, to do that, it's a tremendously positive development for the human being. Uh, but also, I think we also need to put uh, a proper perspective on, on, on these things. Um, we need to understand the size of the Chinese economy is becoming bigger is purely because China has a population that is four times as large as the U.S. population. So in terms of per capita GDP, in terms of uh, uh, productivity, China is still way behind the most advanced countries. So to drive to drive China to continue to develop, you know, producti uh, lifting productivity, uh, increasing uh, efficiency, uh, improve uh, renovation, I think all these things will matter fundamentally uh, to lift China to the next stage. Rama, uh, Ravi Ramamurthy, if we look at another metric right now, if we see these countries with uh, you know, great economic growth rates, and we look at who are the beneficiaries of this, if we take a country like India, I mean, India this report says it's predicted to grow to the world's second largest economy. Uh, but does that mean there's going to be a rise in living standards for everyone? Because there also was another report a few days ago which said that the nine uh, richest people in India have as much wealth as the bottom 50 percent. Uh, that's a fair question. I think uh, uh, let's not forget when we talk about India becoming the second largest uh, economy, as I said before, we're measuring it in PPP terms. And just to give your audience uh, a sense of how important that is, how you measure it, uh, G India's GDP in PPP terms is four times what it is at market exchange rates. So keep that in mind when you talk about how big or how important a player India will be on the global stage. Now that said, going back to your question, the problem of unequal incomes is, is a global problem. And India is no exception to it. A lot of the benefits of uh, rapid growth have gone to a very small slice of the population. And in, in India's case particularly, we have a very large number of uh, young people entering the labor force and creating jobs for all of them and keeping them productively employed is a very important part of actually achieving these growth rates that India's uh, pr uh, expected to achieve. So if you can't harness the expanding labor force, and this is a big difference between China and India. India, China's labor force has already peaked. India's has a long way to go, but if you cannot harness that labor force, and there are some indications already that India is struggling to harness the labor force productively, then uh, India would have a major social challenge ahead of itself.
But as you point out, Ravi, the big advantage India has is that half of its population is under the age of 25. When we look around the world, there is an aging population. That's true. So it is potentially an advantage. People always talked about the uh, demographic dividend for the Indian case, but it's not an automatic. You know, unless the policies are in place to, to harness that talent and to actually nurture and develop the talent and give it the skills it requires, especially as technological change takes hold, this can turn, if it's a double-edged sword, that could actually uh, hurt more than it helps. And frankly, I'm a bit concerned about the administrative capacity of the Indian government to, to be able to plan and execute policies that will harness the human talent that India potentially has to offer. Perry Wong, wealth inequality is also prevalent in China uh, if we use the uh, measurement that is commonly used, which is the Gini uh, coefficient. Uh, how does the Chinese government ensure that the uh, wealth of the country is distributed fairly? Yeah, I, I think to begin with, I think I totally agree with the previous speakers. I think the inclusiveness uh, at the beginning uh, uh, during the rapid development uh, stage is critical. So in other words, I think if you look at the Chinese uh, experience, I wouldn't call it model, but experience, is that the Chinese government did several things right with the massive infrastructure building, rapid urbanization, and most importantly, it included almost everyone, and, and you can say everyone, from peasants to workers uh, to young people and middle-aged people. So everyone got off in a pretty good start. Now, it, it came later with problems when the accumulation of wealth becomes so massive and the, the reform in, in enterprises level actually affected the wealth distributions. So, but that's a later stage game. Uh, so the success comes with the utilization of well utilization of workforce and a rather equal distribution of wealth, at least at the very beginning. So everyone is for it. Okay, we need to take a break right now. More of our conversation when we return. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.